If I were to describe the basic mechanics of Middle-earth Shadow of Mordor to you, you'd think I was actually talking about Assassin's Creed. On the surface, Shadow of Mordor is Assassin's Creed, set in the Lord of the Rings universe. You ascend tall structures and engage in rhythmic combat against large numbers of swordsmen. You activate a special mode of vision that allows you to identify objects and people of interest. I wouldn't call Shadow of Mordor a ripoff, but its inspirations are clear. That doesn't mean that Shadow of Mordor isn't great on its own terms, though. You hold a single button to rush up towers and leap improbable distances, and fluid animations make the locomotion feel breezy and fun. An Uruk Archer may be waiting atop that tower, but no matter. Another button allows you to stab him from below. Or you could always sneak up from behind and sink your hidden blade, I, I mean, your totally unhidden dagger, into his sticking flesh. Shadow of Mordor shares some of the camera and movement foibles that can make Assassin's Creed irritating, but it also greatly refines and improves other aspects of that formula. Combat, for instance, has a similar kind of flow, but it's more challenging than you might be used to. Hordes of uruk high surround you, and your experience with other games might fool you into thinking you can manage the mob, but there are times when you must simply run. To face the Uruk Swarm, even when you time your counterattacks properly, is often to face your own demise and subsequent resurrection. I'm looking forward to being a captain. Shadow of Mordor features not just one hero, but two. You are a ranger called Talion, but you are also a bitter wraith who shares Talion's body. For all purposes, Talion should be dead, but his spiritual homecoming has been delayed by this unholy union. The two's journey of discovery takes them through Mordor and a nearby region, where death and decay are a common sight. This ranger-wraith hybrid leads to Shadow of Mordor's slickest moments. When the wraith's anger becomes all-consuming, Talion's face melts away to reveal the apparition underneath. Rage is a common emotion in Mordor on the part of both the wraith and the Urukai Talion and his companion face. Unfortunately, the story is too disjointed to be called one of the best Lord of the Rings tales. Gollum is as disquieting a presence as ever, but for every recognizable character, there is a less established one. The game's main villains appear before they're even properly introduced. The incomplete storytelling, combined with a series of tepid final encounters, unfortunately softens the impact of the game's conclusion. The standard uruk are your primary foes, though captains and war chiefs are the most challenging ones you'll face. A captain's arrival is a big deal. Your sword meets the leaders, the camera zooms in, and the Uruk taunts you. Upon a first meeting, the captain may promise you a grisly dismemberment. Should you die and face the same captain again, he'll wonder how you cheated death. Should have stayed in your grave, maggot. You'll be back there soon enough. Such melodrama. The only problem with making a mountain out of every molehill is one of pacing. After a while, you can become annoyed by the incessant theatrical introductions, which can really disrupt the flow. Ah, I finally caught up with you! I had to cross Mordor, it's over! Now you die! Yeah! Captains aren't impossible to defeat, of course, but you'll be better equipped to beat them once you add a few additional skills to your repertoire, which you do by performing missions and assassinating enemies. Your greatest tool isn't your blade, though, or your ghostly bow, but the uruk themselves. You can view the uruk political hierarchy at a glance, but in order to learn a captain's identity and combat weaknesses, you need intel, which you usually gain by taking over an Uruk's mind. Again, overthrowing a captain or warchief is not always a walk in the park, so knowing that your enemy is invulnerable to stealth kills makes all the difference. You can even instill fear in captains by shooting explosive barrels and catching them on fire, or by riding a Karagor into battle. Oh, did I not mention you can mount a four-legged beast and command it to feast on Uruk entrails? Well, you can, and it's awesome. 
Shadow of Mordor's second half introduces even more ways to mess with Oryx's minds. Ultimately, you're able to command individual captains and assist them in battle as they fight their way up the pecking order. The story gives this system a purpose so that your political shenanigans don't come across as never-ending busywork, though even without narrative context, the Nemesis system is remarkably absorbing. All of these tasks are dotted across the game's two expansive maps, which invite you to chase one waypoint after another, murdering captains, infiltrating Uruk feasts, and collecting artifacts that unveil truths about the past. What's great about Shadow of Mordor isn't that it gives you so much to do, though, but that it finds a way to be unique, even though it's superficially so similar to another game. Who would have thought that Mordor could be such an inviting place to explore?